Hello everybody, today I'm going to be picking up in week two of Introduction to Brit Lit 2. Today we're going to be talking about William Blake. Last week we read um, some texts from some women voices and so we're going to start a couple of series of men voices here in the Romantic period. Um, I'm really very kind of fond of William Blake um, for twofold reason. I love his poetry but also uh, as an art minor I loved um, studying about William Blake's etchings and his engravings, um, and he was an artist, definitely an artist in many more ways than just uh, being a poet. So today we're going to talk a little bit about him first, and then we're going to go through the collection of William Blake's poems that I've chosen for us to discuss for this week, week two. Um, William Blake was born in London on November 28, 1757 to James and Catherine Blake. James is a hosier, which meant he made hosiery and um, like stockings and socks uh, for men and women. Um, from a very early age, they knew that he was a little bit different. He often spoke of having visions, so he would see things when he was dreaming, when he was, even when he was awake. Um, at age four, he thought he saw God, put his head through a window. Um, at age nine, um, while he was outside walking, he saw a tree filled with angels, and so they knew he was a little bit different than other children from a very early age. He was taught to read and write at home, um, but he really wanted to become a painter. So at age 10, his parents sent him to drawing school. He began writing poetry at age 12. At age 14, his parents could no longer afford to keep him in art school, so he began an apprenticeship with an engraver, um, which would have meant that he was etching onto metal. Um, in 1782, he married Catherine Boucher, who was illiterate, and Blake taught her how to read and write as well as how to print. She would later help him print the illuminated poetry for which he is remembered today. In addition to his wife, Blake also began training his young younger brother Robert in drawing, painting, and engraving. Robert fell ill during the winter of 1787 and died uh, likely to consumption, which was not uncommon at the time. And as Robert died, Blake thought he saw his brother's spirit rise up to the ceiling, clapping its hands for joy. Um, and he believed uh, that Robert's spirit would continue to come and visit him. Uh, in, in dreams and in waking, and that in a dream, Robert taught him the printing method that he used in his two volumes, uh, Songs of Innocence um, and Songs of Experience, and those were his illuminated poetry. Blake's first printed work, Poetical Sketches, was a collection of apprenticeship verse, apprentice verse, um, mostly in, uh, imitating classical models, um, protesting against war, tyranny, King George III's treatment of the American colonies. He published his most popular collection, Songs of Innocence, in 1789, and followed it in 1794 with Songs of Experience. Both books of songs were printed in an illustrated format. Uh, that he called illuminated manuscripts. So the text and the illustrations were printed from copper plates, and each picture was finished by hand in watercolors. Blake was a nonconformist. Um, he associated with some of the leading radical thinkers of his day, including Thomas Paine, Mary Wollstonecraft, which we have talked about before. Um, and in defiance of 18th century neoclassical conventions, he privileged. Uh, imagination over reasoning, which is a key um, component of the um, Romantic period that we talked about. Um, and he also believed that his poetry should be read and understood by everybody. So he didn't want to do this lofty uh, language and, and, and that was un, unreachable for uh, even the common um, common man, but he also was determined not to sacrifice his vision in order to become popular. Um, so let's take a look at, and I want to show you, let me see if I can pull that up really quick. Yeah, okay, my text notes are attached to this, and so I went through and, and um, 
dropped in some of his art work from his um, poetry volumes um, and so these were created those illuminated um, masterpieces that he, he made to go along with his um, with his poetry so were made from copper plates um, and then he would go in by hand and they were engraved in copper plates and he would go in by hand and paint in the watercolor that you see there right there are the two covers of songs of experience and songs of innocence and then you can see here, and I'll blow it up just a little bit so you can see. They're really so beautiful to see. Um, the, the, the poem, the art that he accompanied each of his poems in his text. So here's the lamb, uh, the tiger. Um, and then we have um, infant joy and infant sorrow next. And then a poison tree. And so if you're ever interested to kind of uh, take a look at some of those, I, I've always found they were particularly um, beautiful. Even before I read, read really a lot of his poetry, I, I found the engravings to be um, very unique and very beautiful. Okay, we're going to start with um, the companion pieces, the tiger and the lamb. So, um, you know, you have these two books of poetry. You have Songs of Innocence. And then songs of experience, they kind of juxtaposed those opposing sides of human nature, innocence and experience. And, and we can read that as like corruption and, and, and what, what happens to us, you know, we're born innocent and then we're corrupted by our experiences. And so their companion pieces, we're going to look at two sets of those with the lamb and the tiger and then infant joy and infant sorrow. And then we'll finish it up with um, a poison tree because I do, I like a poison tree. I like its message. So the lamb is two stanzas each with five rhymed couplets so that means that every two lines rhyme with each other there's five sets of those in each um, stanza so uh, repetition in the first and the last couplet creates a refrain kind of gives us nursery rhyme vibes um, and it helps provide the poem with its song-like quality. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee, gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead, gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly bright, gave thee such a tender voice, making all the veil rejo veils rejoice. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee, little lamb, I'll tell thee, he is called call it by his, thy name for he calls himself a lamb he is meek and he is mild he became a little child i a child and now a lamb we are called by his name little lamb god bless thee little lamb god bless thee so it's written as a form of dialogue between a child and the lamb you know a lamb is a universal symbol of innocence um, but it is also very much uh, a, a symbol of, of Christ um, who is the Lamb of God and that's what we're looking at here. Well, the Lamb is a didactic poem. It's addressed to a particular individual who is seen as the primary object uh, in the poem and acts as a model for the reader. So the poet is, is really paying tribute to Christ who was innocent uh, and pure like a child and meek and mild like a lamb. So it starts out, the child is asking the lamb if he knows who has created it. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Um, and then he asked who has blessed it with the life that he's living, giving it the capacity to feed um, by the stream and or the mead, giving that clothing of delight. Uh, softest clothing, woolly bright, gave thee such a tender voice, making all the veils rejoice. Um, does he know who is the one who has created him for this life that he lives? Okay, in the next stanza, in the, in the next set of lines, um, the child himself is answering the question, little lamb, I'll tell thee, little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. So, the child says that the person who's created him and has given the many gifts that he described in the first stanza is himself called by the name of the Lamb, which we know the Lamb of God. Um, and 
he said that Jesus is was meek, uh, submissive. He was mild, soft-natured, and he became a child uh, for the sake of mankind. If you think about your Bible story of of Jesus being born in Bethlehem to to Mary and Joseph, and uh, he he did that for the sacrifice of mankind, uh, became a child and and raised up, and eventually would die for mankind's sins. Um, so the lamb identifies with Christ here to form a, uh, like a trinity of child, lamb, and redeemer. I, child, and now a lamb. Um, we are called by his name. And so it, it really conveys maybe overall the spirit of childhood, uh, the whole poem, the purity, the innocence, the tenderness, the affection that a child feels for all of the little creatures, and it also um, glorifies Christ, okay? Let's take a look next at um, the tiger, because they're often featured as, as companions to each other, like a juxtaposed against each other so a little bit different in structure whereas before we had those uh, we had those two stanzas with five uh, couplets uh, ten lines essentially in each stanza here in the tiger we have six stanzas of four lines each there's a very neat structure with regular meter and rhyme scheme a a b b c c d d um, with the first and the last stanza repeating with the exception of one word. Um, and within it, the speaker asked 13 different questions over the poem's entirety. Let's read it and we will, um, we will talk about it. So, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what a mortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry in what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes on what wings dare he aspire what the hand there sees the fire sorry i always get the hiccups when i'm reading out loud it's crazy and what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart and when thy heart began to beat what dread hand and what dread feet what the hammer what the brain in what furnace uh what the chain i'm sorry what in what furnace was thy brain what the anvil what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp when the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears did he smile his work to see did he who make the lamb make thee tiger tiger burning bright in the forest of the night what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry dare being the only difference there from the first um, stanza. All right, breaking it down, let's take a look. We have the speaker um, questioning the tiger's beauty and its creator. It's like tiger, tiger, burning brights. What immortal hand or eye could frame that fearful symmetry? Um, and as the poem is going to move on gradually, the speaker is clearly making it a point to question if the, the creator of the tiger is the same creator as the lamb. Um, so we see uh, a lot of descriptions. We see the tiger's bright yellow fur as it, it roams freely in the forest at night. Um, we see um, the... Um, really the 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 darkness and then you have the brightness of the tiger in contrast there um the reader again is 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 kind of wondering if if blake's comparison here is that there's no way that a that a god uh, or is there a way that a god uh, who created something as gentle and innocent as a lamb can create such a um such a powerful um, creature as the tiger. Um, the fearful symmetry that he's talking about um, here is the symmetry of the tiger. So, you know, like in symmetry and art, you know, one side is equal to the other side. Um, but uh, also, it's symmetrical, is it symmetrical to maybe a divine deity? Is this... Uh, if uh, God is the creator, then how does that relate to the tiger? Like how, like 
what is the connection there to the tiger. Uh, out of time on this one, we'll pick back up with screencast number two on William Blake.